The 19th of April, 1989, was shaping up to be a normal day of gunnery practice for the crew of the USS Iowa. At 0831, all turret crew members were ordered to battle stations to begin the exercise, with everyone accounted for 30 minutes later. At the same time, Vice Admiral Jerome L. Johnson and his staff, who were on board to observe Fleet X-389, entered the bridge to observe the exercise. At 0933, Turret 1 opened fire, with the leftmost gun misfiring and the gunnery crew unable to get the gun to fire. Despite protocol stating that the other turrets had to wait for Turret 1 to discharge all of her rifles first before beginning their own loading and firing procedures, Captain Fred Musili, the CO in charge of Iowa, ordered Turret 2 to load and fire her own three-gun salvo. 45 seconds later, the rightmost gun reported loaded, followed 17 seconds later by the leftmost. The center gun, under the command of gunner's mate Richard Lawrence, however, called to senior chief Ziegler, Turret 2's gun chief, and reported, We have a problem here. We are not ready yet. We have a problem here. Staying calm, Ziegler said back over the turret's phones. Left gun loaded. Good job. Center gun is having a little trouble. We'll straighten that out. Then, things started to rapidly deteriorate. Lawrence called out, I'm not ready yet, I'm not ready yet, followed by Gunner's mate Ernie Hanyex calling out, Mort, 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 calling out to Gunner's mate Dale Mortson, the gun chief over in turret 1, for help. Listening helplessly over in turret 1, Mortson didn't even have time to respond before Ziegler shouted, Oh my god, the powder is smoldering. As Hanyex shouted, Oh my god, there's a flash. Minutes later, all 47 crewmen in the turret and the barbette were dead either from the initial explosion of the powder charges, the secondary explosion of the powder bags in the powder handling area, the tertiary explosions from the buildup of carbon monoxide gas, or the resulting asphyxiation from the cyanide gas that was formed from the burning polyurethane foam bags the charges were in. What followed afterwards was the largest cover-up of gross negligence and incompetence in U.S. naval history, one that still remains unresolved to this day. More details now about exactly what happened, when and where. All of this, planning it in a meticulous manner. He didn't even know he was going to be there. But now, faced with the development of weapons with immense destructive power, We've no choice but to maintain ready defense forces that are second to none. Iowa, at this point, was an old ship. Launched in 1942, she served faithfully during World War II and Korea before being decommissioned in 1958 and placed in the Atlantic Reserve Fleet. History wasn't done with her, and under the 600-ship Navy plan, under then-President Ronald Reagan, she was reactivated after an extensive modernization plan in 1984, one year ahead of schedule. That speed came at a cost, however, with repairs to her power plant and guns not completed and the mandatory U.S. Navy Board of Inspection and Survey, or NSERV, not done. It took two years before her NSERV was conducted and she failed miserably. Noting that she could no longer meet her as designed 33 knot top speed, her turrets leaked 55 gallons of hydraulic fluids a week, her guns had not been properly cleared of the storage cosmoline and other engineering issues. The officer in charge of the NSERV, Rear Admiral John Buckley, recommended personally to both CNO Admiral James Watkins and the Secretary of the Navy, John Lehman, that Iowa should immediately be taken out of service to correct these potentially dangerous failures. Lehman, however, utilized his powers as Secretary of the Navy to keep Iowa in service and told the officers of the Atlantic Fleet to ensure the issues brought forth from the in-serve were corrected and rectified. After all, he was the main advocate for bringing the Iowa-class ships back out of reserve. 
A month later, she failed her Operation Propulsion program evaluation on her power plant, but passed it shortly afterwards. Operating mostly in the Atlantic at first, she sailed to join the 6th Fleet in 1987, detached briefly for operations in the North Sea, and then departed in November to the Persian Gulf during the Iran-Iraq War to escort Kuwaiti tankers. Coming back to Norfolk for maintenance and a much-needed overhaul, she finally set herself up for the events of April 19th, 1989. Don, what you know so far? They're still counting aboard this ship, Richard. Uh, 15 dead, uh, as many as 15 dead. 40 who have been injured, uh, most of them with smoke inhalation, have been flown off the ship, medevac. The fire is now out. The explosion took uh, place in the number two, 16 inch. Almost immediately after the explosion, the damage control team sprang into action. Seeing that the detonations came from the center gun and the instruments indicating that the left and right guns hadn't discharged their shells yet, fire crews outside on the deck began to spray water into the barrels to soak the powder and prevent them from detonating if the fires inside the turret reached them. They also sprayed water on top of the turret in an effort to prevent the roof from beginning to warp and crack open under its own weight from the internal fire heating the metal. At the same time, Ensign Dan Meyer, the OIC of Turret 1, Commander Robert Kissinger, Iowa's Chief Weapons Officer, and Gunner's Mate Noah Melendez went below deck with gas masks to inspect the powder flats, noting that the walls were glowing a bright cherry red. Seeing the danger they were in, Kissinger radioed back up to Mussolini and told him he needed to flood the magazines and powder for Turret 2, possibly saving Iowa from further catastrophe that day. By the time it took a fire team to enter the turret and put out the fire, it had been raging for 90 minutes. As soon as he heard the fire was out, Mortensen rushed from turret 1 to help identify the bodies of the dead. Amongst the body parts and burnt corpses, he found Gunner's mate Clayton Hartwig, who was only there that day to help Lawrence due to him being the former center gun captain before his reassignment, at the bottom of the gun pit, missing his lower forearms and leg below the knees. Mortensen could only identify him from a tattoo on his upper left arm. Near him, the gas ejection air valve was also found, leading Mortensen to believe that he'd been in the turret to turn the valve on right before the explosion. He also noticed that the hoist hadn't been lowered as well, even though the hoist doors had been closed. Once the water had been pumped out of the turrets, the bodies were removed without their locations being noted down or photographs taken of the tragic scene within. An EOD technician, Operations Specialist James Drake from the USS Coral Sea, was flown in to unload the still loaded left and right guns. Taking the devastation of the turret and asking the men some questions, he came to the conclusion that, quote, It's my opinion that the explosion started in the center gun room caused by compressing the powder bags against the 16 inch shell too far and too fast with the rammer arm. End quote. The next day, the remains were flown by helicopter to Roosevelt Roads Naval Station, Puerto Rico, and then to the Charles Carson Center at Dover Air Force Base in Delaware. There, the U.S. Navy, with help from the FBI, began the process of attempting to identify all the bodies match body parts to them. Saying they identified all the bodies five days later, they released all of them to their families. It was during this time, Meyer made a rudimentary sketch of the location of the bodies in the turret. His small act would prove vital in the investigations to come. You know, forensics team didn't even come on board and try to figure out what happened, but they said they turned them down. And they, I mean, honestly, they had us clean that stuff up and throw it stuff over the side of the ship. <laughs> Just getting rid of stuff. Yeah. Machinery, you know, no telling what else. Commander John Morse, I was relatively new XO, and under supervision from Lieutenant Commander Bob Holman, began a cleanup of Turret 2 to make it, quote, look as normal as possible. Over the course of the next day, the cleanup crew swept clean and painted the inside of the turret, chucking any loose or damaged equipment overboard. On April 23rd, she arrived back in Norfolk, and a memorial service was held the next day. Thousands attended the service, including then-President George H.W. Bush. Mussolini, after the service, said that the two legal men in the turret were there simply as observers and that everyone in the turret was qualified for both the position they were filling that day. The next day, on April 24th, Kendall Truitt, a close friend of Hartwig's and a fellow sailor who was working down in Turret 2's powder room at the time of the explosion, informed Hartwig's family that he had taken out a $50,000 double 
indemnity life insurance policy, which pays out double the amount in the event of an accidental death. Two years ago, on himself and named Truett as the sole beneficiary. Despite Truett promising Hartwig's family that he would pay them the whole insurance policy, Kathy Kupasina, Hartwig's sister, mailed letters to Mussolini, Morris, Lieutenant Commander Kenneth Costigan, Iowa's gunnery officer, Lieutenant Commander Kames Danner, Iowa's chaplain, and to Ohio Senators Howard Medicinebaum and John Glenn, detailing the policy and asking that they spoke with Truett to convince him to give the money to Hartwig's parents. It was at this point that the Navy started to form their argument to have a scapegoat out of their current predicament. While the officers aboard Iowa were starting to plot how to lessen the damage to their reputation as officers for creating the environment that led to the explosion in the turret, CNO Admiral Trost issued a moratorium on the firing of all 16-inch guns in the fleet. At the same time, Vice Admiral Joseph Donnell of Surface Forces Atlantic appointed Commodore Richard Milligan, formal commanding officer of USS New Jersey, to conduct an informal one-officer investigation into the cause of the explosion. Boarding Iowa on April 20th with his personal staff, Milligan toured Turret 2 and began to interview crew members. Despite seeing the cleanup efforts by the crew under supervision of officers, he did not make any effort to stop it. Because who needs forensic evidence, you know? One of the people interviewed was Meyer, who informed Milligan of the gunnery experiments that Master Chief Fire Controlman Stephen Skelly and Gunnery Officer Lieutenant Commander Kenneth Costigan had been conducting with the guns. These experiments were designed to increase the range of the main battery by using the supercharged powder bags and specially designed shells for the purpose and, as it was found out later, were not approved by the Naval Sea Systems Command, or NAVC. After explaining that these experiments were conducted with Mussolini and Kissinger's blessings and without supervision, Captain Edward Messina, Milligan's chief of staff, stopped the interview, told the stenographer to stop typing, took Meyer out of the room, and told him, quote, You little shit! You can't say that! The Admiral doesn't want to hear another word about experiments! End quote. Re-entering the room, Meyer then told them about how Mortensen had found and identified Hartwig's body at the bottom of the gun pit. Sensing something wrong about the investigation, Meyer warned Mortensen before his interview that he needed to be careful about what he said, because in his opinion, quote, Milligan and some of his staff appeared to have a hidden agenda, end quote. As it would turn out later, after reading transcripts of their testimonies, they found that parts had been altered or expunged from the record to change what they had said, including where Hartwig's body had been found. Brian Scanio, one of the first firefighters into Turret 2 during the damage control effort, said of his interview, quote, I told them everything that ha exactly happened, and it seemed that when I said certain things, they just stopped the recorder, and they'd go on and ask a different question, and they wouldn't finish the question they were on, end quote. Furthering the suspicions of Meyer and Mortensen, Milligan refused to allow Scanio to identify that it was Hartwig's body at the bottom of the gun pit. Interviewing Skelly, he admitted that he knew that it was illegal to use the D846 powder with a super heavy shell, it literally says it on the powder bag, and that he had no written permission from NAVC to conduct his experiments and that he led Mussolini wrongly and that he did. Mussolini, during his interview, said that the U.S. Navy had, quote, given him a bunch of misfits for his crew, end quote. Heading up the technical investigation into the cause of the explosion was Captain Joseph Missley from NAVC. From the outside, he seemed the perfect choice for the job. Between 1982 and 1985, he headed up the Naval Weapons Support Center at Crane, Indiana, where the powder that Iowa was using had been bagged as well as where they began using the polyurethane bags to store the powder bags in under his direction. He knew the shells, powder, and storage better than possibly anyone. Underneath, however, this tainted him from the start. This intimacy with the various aspects that had gone wrong to cause the explosion created a conflict of interest for Maselli. If it turned out that the powder or powder bags had been central to the cause of the explosion, he would be directly to blame. As Ted Gordon, former Navy Deputy Judge Advocate General and the CO of the NIS at the time said, Joe Maselli had his own turf to protect, 
the guns, the shells, the powder were all his responsibility. He had a vested interest in seeing that they were not at fault in the Iowa accident. So as you can see, everyone from the officers on board the ship to literally the officers put in charge of the investigation have their own selves to look after. And now they have the perfect scapegoat in Hartwig. Now, Million reported that a book called Getting Even, the complete book of dirty tricks, was found in Hartwig's locker, and that book contained instructions on how to construct a bomb. They used this along with the insurance policy that Hartwig had taken out that named Truett the beneficiary to construct this theory that Hartwig and Truett were in a homosexual relationship and they ran with it. They even interviewed Truett's wife asking some incredibly inappropriate questions such as how many times her and Truett had had sex together, what type of sexual acts they engaged in, and if she herself had slept with any of Truett's shipmates. Now, on from Truett's side of things, he just said he and Hartwig were really close friends and they were shore buddies when they went ashore because that is something the Navy tells you to do when you go ashore in a foreign country. Where did all the talk about homosexuality come from? I'd like to ask you the same question. Um, I think a lot of it stemmed from the fact that neither one of us came back drunk all the time and uh, we could carry on an intelligent conversation without, you know, having to talk about cars or just this or that. And we enjoyed each other's company so whenever we went overseas they they always tell you to go off and a pair you know go with friends anyway because you are in a foreign country and we spent a lot of time together all during this investigation the nis investigation began to appear in various newspapers like the washington post and new york times and in an nbc broadcast as well so this became the forefront of the investigation in the eyes of the public that the Navy was investigating Hartwig, who they suspect was in a homosexual relationship with Truett. Now, part of this report that was leaked to the press included the testimony of Seaman David Smith, who was a very good friend of Hartwig's. He was interrogated for eight hours where he denied that Hartwig was a homosexual. He was forced to stand watch for nine hours after that interrogation, and then at the end of his watch, he was interrogated again for another six hours. So that's around 23 hours of being awake. He then, under duress, admitted that Hartwig made romantic advances toward him, showing him an explosive timer, and threatened to blow up turret too. Now, he later recanted the claim, just three days later in fact, but his initial testimony was leaked to the press in that report. So with Hartwig still being the main suspect, a Lieutenant Commander Thomas Mounts, who was a clinical psychologist assigned to help the NIS investigation, asked the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit, or the BAU, that's right, I've seen criminal minds, to create a psychological autopsy on Hartwig. Now, the interviews they were given over were very highly edited interviews with the crewmen, including Smith's recanted interview. And using this, the Behavioral Analysis Unit came to the conclusion that he was not a homosexual, but he died as a result of his own actions, staging his death in such a fashion that he hoped it would appear to be an accident. Essentially, he had committed suicide and hoped it would be ruled accidental so that Truett would receive the double payout of the insurance money. Now, the FBI was also assisting in the investigation by double-checking the Navy's metallurgical laboratory's work, where the Navy came to the conclusion that an electronic timer had been used in the explosion. Now, the FBI ran the same test to verify and confirm the Navy's findings. The FBI, however, shattered whatever bit of relief Maselli might have had at the time because their testing of the timing ban failed to come to the same conclusion and instead believed the trace elements they found in the timing ban was from the solvent the Navy had used to dislodge the shell from the gun when they unloaded the guns. And then three months later, the technicians at the Naval Weapons Support Center in Crane, Indiana, confirmed not the Navy's testing, but the FBI's testing that an electronic timer, batteries, or a primer had not been used to cause the detonation. So naturally, Maselli said that a chemical timer had been used. <laughs> uh, he changed the story. It wasn't an uh, electronic ignition device now or an electronic timer, it was now a chemical timer or a chemical ignition device that was used to cause the explosion. Then on July 15th, 
Milligan submitted a complete report saying that the explosion was a deliberate act, most probably committed by Hartwig, using an electronic timer. The conclusion of the report stated that while the powder bags had been overrammed into the gun, it was done so under Hartwig's direction to trigger the explosive timer he had placed between two of the bags while over the gun breech. On the 28th, Donnell endorsed the report and said that the determination that Hartwig had sabotaged the guns leaves the reader incredulous, yet the opinion is supported by facts and an analysis from which it flows logically and inevitably. Now, this report was forwarded to Admiral Tross, but by the time Tross received the report, the test results had come back from Dahlgren stating that the electronic timer had not caused the explosion. Despite this announcement from Maselli himself, Tross still endorsed the report on August 31st, stating that Hartwig was, quote, the individual who had motive, knowledge, and physical position within the turret gun room to place a device in the powder train and even cited Smith's recanted interview as further evidence against Hartwig. Later on September 7th, Milligan formally briefed the media at the Pentagon on the formal report, even showing the books that they supposedly found in Hartwig's locker, uh, the Getting Even, the Complete Diary of Dirty Tricks book, along with a new one, a Department of the Army Field Manual Improvised Munitions Handbook. Now, due to several of the issues that we've mentioned with the Navy's initial investigation, the House Armed Service Committee held their own investigation into the Navy's investigation. During this investigation, the chairman, Sam Nunn, requested that Sandia National Laboratories assist with the Navy's still ongoing technical investigation as a third-party entity to investigate the cause of the, de of the detonation and turret 2. Sandia began their investigation five days before the House Committee started on December 7, 1989. Initially to have a baseline comparison and attempt to confirm or deny the final conclusion that it was an electronic or mechanical source that caused the explosion, Richard Swobel, the head of the investigation led by Sandia, asked Maselli for the shells from Turret 2's left and right guns to compare against the shells from the center gun. Maselli told Swobel that both shells had somehow been misplaced and couldn't be located for the comparison. Continuing along, on January 16, 1990, at a meeting between Sandy and the Navy, it was reported that Steve Mitchell, a technician from Indian Head Naval Surface Warfare Center, and his team had discovered that the propellant pellets that made up the powder in the powder bags could fracture and create hot fragments in drop tests and that the fractured surface often had a burnt appearance and odor due to the internal burning of the fragments. Maselli interjected saying that, quote, this kind of thing can't be duplicated during the actual loading operation. This result is not relevant to the explosion, end quote. Further frustrating Maselli, Mitchell also reported that his team also found it extremely unlikely that friction or static electricity could have ignited the powder bags. Even more damning, Tom Doran, a member of Maselli's team at Dahlgren, while the Navy was conducting their technical investigation, reported that his own team had conducted overram tests, but the bags they had access to were just filled with wooden pellets with black powder pouches at the end, not actual powder bags. Sandia then asked if the two turret explosions on USS Mississippi could be related due to those also being open breach explosions, just like what had happened in turret 2. Maselli's team responded that they weren't related because they weren't explosions, but, quote, intense burnings of the powder bags, meaning that they were different causes. Rear Admiral Robert Ailes, a staff officer from the Navy Sea Systems Command, also told Sandia that the Mississippi explosions, quote, would not be discussed. Running tests and simulations using a Cray supercomputer they had access to, Carl Schuler, a member in Sandia's investigative team, determined that the five powder bags had been rammed 24 inches into the gun, three inches farther than the Navy had said in Milligan's report. By the end of the simulations, the overran combined with the 2,800 pounds per, force per square inch of pressure from the rammer itself against the powder bags caused the powder bags to ignite. Another group, headed by Paul Cooper, were performing physical drop tests with small bags of the D. 84-6 powder from March to May of 1990. Their conclusion was that the tear or trim layer 
which was a small amount of powder placed at the ends of the powder bags to even the bag's weight when the powder was rebagged in the 1980s under Maselli's direction, would often ignite when compressed under high speeds, just like what was shown in the simulations that Schuler was running. Cooper also discovered that the burning fragments that Borders reported wouldn't ignite adjacent powder in the same bag, but would instead burn through the bag and ignite the adjacent bag's tear patch, setting off all the bags. May 7th, Schwobel, armed with this new information, asked Baselli to conduct drop tests at Dahlgren, using five actual bags of D846 compressed into a steel cylinder the same diameter as the 16-inch guns. Maselli responded that Cooper's findings, quote, has no relation to the actual 16-inch gun conditions, end quote, and refused the request. Going above him and concerned that Maselli was placing more gun crews at, at risk, Schwobel conducted Rick DeBobes, Nunn's counsel for the Senate committee. Seven days later, Nunn sent a letter directly to Trost requesting that the Navy conduct the Sandia test and that Sandia be allowed to observe the testing. The same day the letter was received, Maselli's supervisor, Vice Admiral Peter Heckman, commander of the Sea Systems Command, called Sandia's president, Al Narath, and told him the Navy would conduct the test and Sandia would be invited to participate in the testing. Under Maselli and Dorn's directions, the tests were conducted using five vertically stacked using D846 powder bags with an 860 pound weight on top of them dropped three feet onto a steel plate to simulate a high-speed overram against the end of a 16-inch shell. On May 24, 1990, on the 18th drop test under observation by Cooper and Schuler, the powder bags exploded, destroying the entire testing apparatus. Immediately, Maselli informed Heckman, who had told Navy leadership, who then halted all use of the 16-inch guns and reopened the investigation. With a single detonation, the Navy's initial call to the explosion quite literally went up in gun smoke. The day after the test detonation, Schwobel, Schuler, Cooper, and Borders briefed the Senate committee on the results of their investigation, stating that, in Sandia's opinion, the explosion occurred because of an overram that was either an accident due to human error or equipment failures. None, in his closing remarks, rejected Milligan's initial report of an internal act causing the explosion and that the initial conclusions were not supported by quote by reliable probative and substantial evidence end quote and that quote quote the navy's whole investigative technique here should be under serious question end quote frank conahan from the gao also testified that the gao found that the iowa class weren't being assigned an equal share of personnel in comparison to other navy ships especially for the main guns and that the non-judicial punishment rates on the Iowas was 25% higher than the rest of the Navy. Conahan concluded that because of this issues of the limited deployment availability of the Iowas, they, quote, seem to be in the top candidates for deactivation as we look for ways to scale back U.S. forces, end quote. After a second investigation, Admiral Kelso conducted a press conference on October 17, 1991. 17 months after the second investigation was opened. Noting that the Navy spent $25 million on this new investigation, he stated that Considering all the evidence now available, the opinion that the explosion on board USS Iowa on 19 April 1989 resulted from a wrongful intentional act is not conclusively established by the evidence. Neither an intentional act nor an accidental cause can be proven or dismissed given the limits of science and the dynamics of the blast and its aftermath. Without clear and convincing proof, an opinion no matter how equivocally stated, that an individual may have intentionally brought about his own death and the deaths of 46 of his shipmates is inappropriate. Accordingly, the opinion that the explosion resulted from a wrongful intentional act is disapproved. The exact cause of the explosion is unknown. The initial investigation was an honest attempt to weigh impartially all the evidence as it existed at the time. And indeed, despite the Sandia theory and almost two years of subsequent testing, a substantial body of scientific and expert evidence and analysis continued to support the initial investigation finding that no plausible accidental cause can be established. However, the initial investigation could not and did not state conclusively that Gunners made Clayton Hardwick cause the blast. Because there is no conclusive proof to support either theory, the final official Navy position 
on the cause of the Iowa explosion is that the exact cause cannot be determined. For this, on behalf of the U.S. Navy, I extend my sincere regrets to the family of GM2 Hardwig. There is no clear and convincing proof of the cause of the Iowa explosion, and the Navy will not imply that a deceased individual is to blame for his own death or the deaths of others without such clear and convincing proof. He also announced that the Navy will never again use an informal board composed of a single officer to investigate such incidents again. Due to legal reasons, Kelsey was advised not to provide a full apology to Harkwood's family. Personal opinion, my personal opinion is <clears throat> we have the best Navy in the world, number one. I don't think there's any question of that. And our enlisted people are the heart of that because they are the technicians, the operators, and that's what, what sets us apart from the Soviets and other navies. They are the backbone of the fleet. After all was said and done, and after the turret was superficially repaired, turret 2 would never operate again and was sealed shut. I was then finally decommissioned on October 26, 1990, but back into the reserve fleet. Her sister ships Wisconsin and Missouri participated in the Gulf War and fired 1,182 16-inch shells with no mishaps. In March of 2001, she was towed from her berth at Newport all the way to California to be mothballed at Susan Bay near San Francisco. Then in May of 2012, she was moved one last time to San Pedro, California, and is now a museum ship, ending her long service to the U.S. Navy permanently. Both Milligan and Maselli retired from Navy shortly after 1992, Musili retired in 1990, and surprisingly, at the change of command for Iowa in May 1990, he criticized the Navy for their handling of the investigation, saying that the investigators were, quote, people who in their rush to manage the Iowa problem forgot about doing the right thing for the Iowa crew, end quote. He later told the Washington Post, quote, only God knows what really happened in that turret. We're never really going to know for sure, end quote. Seemingly showing regret for his actions during the investigations and possibly for creating the circumstances that led to the explosion in the first place. Skelly transferred to Wisconsin in 1990-91 and helped direct her gunnery during the Gulf War. He retired from the Navy in 1998. Meyer resigned in 1991 and in his resignment letter criticized the Navy the most, stating that the Navy's investigation into this explosion and that Maselli's and others of officers' roles in what appeared to be an official cover-up of the actual events was unacceptable and unbecoming of the Navy. Troop was denied re-enlistment, probably due to his speaking to the press and defending Hartwig against the allegations the Navy had thrown at him. After being discharged on February 9, 1990, he continued to attempt to clear Hartwig's name by speaking with the media. To this day, the Navy has still not retracted the prior claims from the first investigation, nor has it formally apologized for using Hartwig as an easy scapegoat to pin the tragedy on. Only that there was no, quote, clear and convincing proof, end quote, that Gunner's mate Hartwig was to blame, according to Kelso. Thankfully, no large-scale incidents such as what occurred that day on April 19, 1989, has happened since. But the memories of Turret 2's detonation still linger on and haunt both the U.S. Navy and surviving family members and friends to this day. Every year at Iowa Point at Norfolk Naval Station and at Iowa herself in San Pedro, a memorial ceremony is conducted in memory of the 47 sailors that lost their lives that day. While they didn't receive the full justice that they deserve, their memory is, at least, still honored to this day. May they all rest in peace.